Hi, I'm Owen from REST Australia. Thanks for tuning in to the REST Network. Before we get into today's show, there are a few things we have to go over. Firstly, what you're about to hear and see is limited to general information only. It's not personal financial advice like you'd get from a financial planner. Also, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. That means that anything that's happened in the past, or we say today, is not necessarily going to reflect what happens in the future. Lastly, please consider that any of the guests or myself are featuring on this program may have a financial interest in some of the products or shares mentioned. That's enough from me. I hope you enjoyed today's program. Kate, welcome to this episode of the Australian Finance Podcast. It is good to be back, Owen. Yes, it is indeed. We have a very special guest in the studio with us today. <laughs> special Kate, guest. Special <laughs> guest. Kate, I might let you do a bit of an intro to our guest because I know you've worked together in the past. So, yeah. familiar faces. Evan, welcome to the studio. Thanks for having me, KC. And again, look at that. Like, yeah, but, look at that. <laughs> that's what we're talking about off air. Like, this is it's a bit weird sitting next to people. Look, you're, real, you're actually real people. Real and people. actually, yes. sitting across, like you guys, I've also spent my entire two and a half years since the pandemic started cozied up in a room yep. talking mm. through a mic like this but with a computer in front of me so it is nice to sit here and actually yeah. speak to real people <laughs> now Talk. yeah listeners won't know but I actually worked with evan at investmart for a few years a few years ago pre-covid mm-hmm. almost um and you're the chief market strategist head of strategy uh what what does that role entail because i don't think we've had anyone with that title no, before on the haven't. show no you haven't and and what does it entail so that's the way I ask that question, when I get that, I answer the question back as saying strategy is the one thing that I don't think people fully understand. And, and why I say that is when you look at investing, my background originally was bottom-up research, sitting there doing the fundamentals. I want to know that sort of stuff mm-hmm. that you've done in the past too and literally burying yourself deep, deep into the financials and just you know loving that. <laughs> and I did and I don't deny that but – The thing that kept coming up more and more and more and more as I kept going through my career was that it's all well and good to know the fundamentals. It's all well and good to then try and tell clients, this is why BHP is absolutely rock solid, blah, 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 or Mm. why you need to get out of ANZ and go into NAB because of all this bottom-up research. There was no strategy to it. There's no understanding that right now is a great point to sort of answer your question, Kate, about why strategy is absolutely paramount because without a strategy right now you're going to stuff up let's be honest Mm. so Mm. what is forgotten right now is that the asx is down four and a bit percent year to date but if you were listening to everybody you would think that it's probably halved yeah Um, you'd also probably look at the us and think that it's halved you'd look at it from the point of view that all of your money is gone and therefore your strategy is there to design to actually make you look in a different and reorientate your view. So if your strategy is to actually invest, you guys know this as well as I do, and the guys watching this at the moment know as well as I do, that if you're entering into particularly equities, which has a risk premium inside of it, that your entry point, as soon as you do that, has a five-year time frame at a minimum. Mm. So then let's get back to what I just said about the ASX being down 4% and what have you. If you then look at, let's say you started investing in 2020, just before the pandemic hit, and you look at where you are today, and you average that two and a half years, which is still well and truly inside that five-year time frame, you're averaging about six and a half to seven percent, depending on when you started, right? Over those two years, per year, not total, per year. Because you're up about 14.5% to 16%, depending where you're at. Some people, if they started, unfortunately, at a really wrong time in early February 2020, are probably up about 12%. That's actually quite a standard balanced return, right? And then again, the ASX over the last 10 years, the average return of the ASX over the last 10 years is 9.8% on a total returns basis. But for that average, you're going to experience risk. Mm. The last time the ASX got to 9.8 in the last 10 years is never. The closest it got was in 2016 was about 11.5% up. It's had four down years and six up years in the 10 years that we're talking about. So Hmm. the strategy that I do is about maintaining the discipline and understanding that, we'll talk about this, I know, but not all your eggs in one basket, understanding that one equity is definitely not a you know a sector. It's not a strategy. It's not what have you. And even one index is not a strategy or a sector or 
designed to, to, to basically protect you or help you on the upside. So strategy is about forming your risk view, about forming your time horizon. It's also about staying disciplined to what you do. So my whole role of, is basically going through all these stats, understanding, yep, love your BHP, love your NAB or your CBA or your CSL or whatever it is. When you put them together, what does that look like? And how does that actually fit what you want to do? Because in the end, I mean, you guys talk about this all day, every day. What is the financial freedom you're trying to achieve? That's the goal. What's the financial freedom? I mean, if you're investing, you've got to have that thought process. What is my financial freedom? What is my financial goal? If you don't have that, you don't have a strategy. And realistically, you probably shouldn't be investing. Mm. So you're bringing that level head and long-term view to your clients' portfolios, really? Yeah. I mean, and again, if you look at every single time. So if you look at the ASX all the way back to 1992, there has been 20 corrections or bear markets in that period of time. If you bought in 1992 to now, didn't do anything, just total return with all those corrections, GFC, Asian financial crisis, China hard landing, Euro crisis, you know, COVID, and then all the technical ones in between, you're up 13,000%. Sorry, 1,300%. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm trying to remember all the figures in my feet. Yep. But on a capital basis, you're up 311%. But it still shows you that with all of that mayhem, you're still so far ahead. It's not funny. Mm. It also shows the importance of like reinvesting yep. um, the income that comes from investing in a diversified portfolio. Yeah. Um, you've talked about time horizons here quite a bit. One of our questions is, in your opinion, why is it important to start early? Why is it important to like if, you know, there's that Chinese proverb, best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, the next best time is today. Yes, it is. Why, why is that important? So I love that. I've, I've got that problem. I know that one. I've got that sort of pinned on some things that I do in the point of view that hindsight's a beautiful thing. So that's what you're firstly saying in that proverb. Hindsight's a beautiful thing. And there's no better time to start than now. And the reason for that is that, again, if you can get back to what we just discussed, which is that on average, you're going to get over the medium term 6%. If you're going into a balance, it might even be a bit lower now, about 5% or 75 to 8% in a growth fund or 9% in a high growth fund. Mm-hmm. That all of that thing comes down to the eighth wonder of the world, according to Einstein, which is compound. Compound interest is the only set of maths that I think should be taught after school that you just don't. Because obviously, unless you're going to be an engineer or you're going to be a mathematics genius, Compound interest is the only thing that you're going to actually use in your everyday life for the rest of your life. Mm. And compound interest, for those of you that don't understand it, is basically that continual growth that comes. And it's an amazing thing. So again, when you look at how your strategy should be, it's if you start today, and as I said to you, the current historical average of the ASX alone is 9.8%. The current 10-year historical average of the S&P is over 10 um, Then you blend in fixed interest. Now, obviously, fixed interest has had a bit of a period over the last 18 months that's been quite negative mm. but again if you look at fixed interest on a blended basis it's about three percent you put them all together and you're probably starting to give yourself that constant average total returns so that's reinvesting your dividends and reinvesting the, the payouts that you get from your fixed interest or your cash product or whatever it is and allowing that eighth wonder of the world to work in your favor so again everybody compares he's not the greatest one because i think he puts people off but warren buffett is the example he is the exception i understand that when you look at a bell curve right but if you look at warren buffett you can google this go and have a look at warren buffett's personal wealth from when he started to where he is now and it is perfect example of compound interest Mm. it is literally a perfect example it went from you know when he was 12 to when he was about 30 he got up to you know several million bucks from when he was 30 to 65 he started to touch a billion but when he hit 65 and he was around about $20 billion. It absolutely exponentially took off. And that's, again, yes, he's very good at picking. Let's give him that credit. We know about Berkshire Hathaway. But he is exactly what we're talking about. He mm. is the epitome of compound interest. And as he says, you can start any time. Because starting right now, well, you've, you've got a discount to what you were happy to pay at the start of the year or even a discount if you're looking at something more risky, probably at the end of October, you know, November last year. What's what's wrong with now? It's this. Mm. It's and for those of you listening at home on the podcast, I'm touching my head, right? So your mind, your mind is the problem because it's fearful, and everybody has fear, and there's a reason for that, and that's fine. But that's where strategy comes in, and that's what Kate's question was: is mm. that 
if your strategy is that I'm growing for a house deposit or that I'm you know, improving my long-term wealth or that I'm trying to you know, re- save for retirement, they all of a sudden give you time horizons. You know, is that two years? Is that five years? Is that seven? Is that 10? Um, and that all of a sudden can start making your ability to wipe out. Just before I finished, in the S&P 500 since 1900, they average a correction, so 10% decline or more, once a year doesn't obviously happen every year sometimes they have a couple sometimes they have none the average time frame for that correction is 54 trading days which is a blink of an eye in trading and the average decline is 13.4 percent so take that as you will right again you know you use the industry super fund led you know previous uh, um, history is not a future guide or whatever you want to use but it has shown you time and time and time and time and time and time again that the recovery will come. And as I said before, there's been 20 corrections or more in the ASX and you're still up 1,300% um, mm. since those 20 corrections happened out of 30 years. And I know a lot of listeners, because we do talk about compound interest, but we do get some listeners that are starting their journey maybe in their 40s and their 50s and sometimes they feel like it's all a bit too late. And as you said, it, it comes to your mindset. How would you shift if you're in the, oh, it's too late for me to make any meaningful change? Like how do you change that perspective? My mum. <laughs> and no, why I say my mum. So you've just used a great example of like those people in their 40s and their 50s. My mum started investing when she was in her late 60s. All right. And so late 60s, right. it took me 20 years to convince her to do it. There was always an excuse. It was too hard. It wasn't the right time. I don't have the money. I don't know what I'm doing. Despite the fact that she has a son that does this for a living. <laughs> um, and so she finally started in October 2020. Right, so like, what a time to start! Yeah, um, you into, finally got through to her in COVID. Didn't yeah, you? in COVID. <laughs> yeah. And now that she's away, she couldn't. She's like, "Why did I not start sooner?" I said, "Because there are so many mental barriers. There are so many reasons not to start." Um, and she's, you know, she's going through a volatile period now, but she's still well up on what she had. And I said to her, I "said If you had to put that and left the money what you were doing in the cash environment that you had it in, you'd actually be negative." She's still up, even though she's you know she has seen quite a decline this year, which is fine. Um, but she's also now got into the really good strategy habit of adding. So she puts in, and I don't mind saying, about five hundred bucks a month because she doesn't have kids to pay for. We don't live at home. Um, she's got no major expenditure, and she's just building this this nest egg that's outside of super for herself. So in answer to that question, it doesn't matter how old you are. And not only that, like like everybody, those ages that you're talking about, this is the other thing about it. People believe they're going to live forever. Like we, we, this, this is a genuine fact. You talk to people that are over 65 and you actually tell them that technically if you're over 65, the average lifespan of a male in Australia is, is 84. The average lifespan of a female is 89. They're within 20 years of that, right? That's mm. a scary thing to tell yeah. people, but they don't see that and nor should they. So there's no wrong time to start because – in mum's eyes, she's building her wealth for the next 10 to 15 years. Um, and that's, you know, that was finally what I got through to her. And now that she started, she can see it's, it's easy to do. It's simple. She keeps it simple. So she's just doing low cost index funds because she can't do the fundamental stuff that I used yeah. to do. That's, and that doesn't think, want to do it either. Yeah, exactly right. So getting back to your point about those people that are writing into you that are in their 40s and their 50s, particularly those in your 40s, come on, guys, right? <laughs> You've got half your life again, right? If you're 40 years old, right? You've got half mm. your life of again if you're a male and a little bit more. If you're a female, you've even got more than that on the averages. So starting at 40, I'd say that you're, you're young. Like you've got plenty of time yeah. to get on with it. Mm. And building that savings habit is really important, that putting money aside on a regular basis. Yes. Yeah, it is. And I... Again, I know you've spoken to people about you know the advantages of things like dollar cost averaging and buying consistently on a regular basis. So that if you were happy to put money into a savings account, why aren't you happy to put it into an investment account? Because the investment account will have a cash component. It really will. It will have some form of cash component inside of it that will help you. But it then also moves you slightly up the risk reward because this is my words rather than anything. So something that I talk about a lot, today, tomorrow, and beyond. You've got today money. And the today money is what everybody's obsessed with. They have to see it in front of them. This is my cash balance. Bang, thanks very much. 
But tomorrow could be five years away. It could actually be tomorrow. Mm. Beyond is everything else. That is things like your house. That is things like your super. That is the investment portfolio that is building for your kids for you know education or your retirement. But your beyond money can also come forward. So as long as you can think about things in time in a horizon, then all of a sudden your money can stretch and your investment you know, strategy and your ability to actually get into that habit can also happen. Because if you understand that $500 is going for to now, tomorrow and beyond and spread across those three categories, you're not worried that you're taking 300 bucks, sorry, four or 500 bucks or whatever it is out of your today money. It's still in your today money because it's also in your it's tomorrow money and it's in your beyond money. And it's helping that whole pool of, of funds grow. That's the strategy. Mm. One of the things, Evan, is that we often come across the the challenge, I guess, what is it, limiting money belief that people have is, oh, I don't have enough money. Yep. So, so some of our most popular episodes are on things like micro-investing. They're on things like getting started in ETFs or yep. even just in the share market with small amounts of money. So maybe we can run through some of the kind of five ways. We've got five ways on our list, but just some different ways people can get started investing. So first and foremost, micro-investing is a very interesting thing. I don't want to put it down, but from the point of view that don't forget micro-investing, what hurts in micro-investing is fees. Mm. Fees are a killer even when you've got slightly a larger balance. So you know, if you look at the bigger providers, let's not name them, but the bigger providers, they're charging you $14.95 or $19.95 to get in and then to get out, Yeah. right? So if you're buying 100 bucks worth of something, realistically, it's costing you $114.95 and your brokerage, therefore, is 14 and a half, you know, and 95%, near enough to 15%. Mm. That is huge. So be aware that, yet yeah, micro-investing can start you and can certainly help with your habits of growing your habits in a really positive way, but the costs sometimes can be detrimental to you. Mm. But don't let me put that away. Just remember that. Mm. You do want to, therefore, think about starting with some form of balance. I think you need to probably start with a couple of thousand at the minimum. So I will talk about obviously stuff that InvestSmart does now because I think that's probably the way mm. to segue to that, which sure. is one of the things we know we all love and do is spending, right? We're really, really good at spending. Mm. Um, and not only that, there is a reason retail therapy is, a, is out there. It's actually a thing, right? So physiologically, it actually triggers a good feeling. It helps actually also fight yeah. off sadness. That's a I true fact. I think we fact. all saw that during lockdown. It was, yes. just, it was nice yep. to have someone knocking on the door and breaking up the day with a Correct. parcel. <laughs> and then you got this thing that you're like, sweet, fantastic. It made you your know? day feel better yeah, for like an hour and then you went yeah. back to the mundane <laughs> of lockdown. So what InvestSmart thought about was, okay, how can we turn your, your spending habits into an investment habit? Um, and particularly what was also seen during the, the COVID lockdown that you're alluding to there, Kate, is buy now, pay later exploded. And we know about buy now, pay later. Let's not talk about it because yeah. it's personally something that I find quite interesting for the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. So our idea was, okay, if you're happy to spend, what if we offered that spending habit as an investment habit? So if you could put up $4,000 of your own money, we will lend to you, which is probably the right word, $6,000 to give you 10 grand. So getting back to your point, Owen, mm -hmm. about micro investing, you've gone from 100 bucks to ten thousand mm. dollars then also the other part of it is that the way you pay that six grand off is in installments of 300 bucks that 300 bucks is yours right that's your 300 dollars per month like what we're talking about with my mum, for a 25 dollar fee so the fee that we're charging is 25 bucks a month and you can pay that off as fast as you want you don't have to be 300 bucks you can do 500 bucks you can put a thousand dollars the faster you get rid of it happy days but what we're trying to do is there's two points to that you therefore start with a balance that actually will help you get going, give you economies of scale so you're not just buying some micro thing. That brokerage fee from us comes from our provider and it's $4.95, so it's basically negligible rather than your $14.95 or your $19.95. So be aware there is some other little costs in there. But it then gets you into that habit of adding to your portfolio. Mm. And once you get past the six grand and you get to, you know, you've got 10 grand of your own money, invest in the market, you watch how many of you just keep doing it because it's just natural to be putting that 300 bucks away. You've started to realize that it's part of your normal budget and away you go. So that's what fun later is. And, and we have started to see that exact thing that those 
that we're spending are now investing and away from it. The app's now out there and the app is fantastic because it tracks what you're doing. It shows you not just you know what you've done, but it gives you that advantage to see that your portfolio is growing. And even with what's going on right now, the advantage of it is dollar cost averaging. So you are basically still making sure that you're adding into it. It's giving you that better price and away you go. So mm. that's one way. And, look, and then let's get back to the other part of your, your question is around low cost. Low cost is that. That's where the ETFs come into it. And again, that should probably be your start point. The lower cost, the better it is for you. Because again, compound interest, everything comes back to compound, <laughs> compound fees interest. Too. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> so compound fees. And this is like the analogy is always your home loan. Your bank isn't your friend. It's providing you something with a product you need. But don't ever think your bank's your friend because the bank gets the compound on the upside. You get the compound on the downside. Mm. So the higher your interest rate, the more interest you're paying and therefore the less time it takes, you know, the less money you've got, the longer it takes you to pay off. So you should always be calling your bank going, is that the best rate you can do? And if not, run away, dead set. You've got mm. so much more power. So it's the same principle is that the higher your fees in anything you do, investing, housing, blah, 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 get them as low as you possibly can because mm. the bigger they are, the bigger they eat into your overall returns. Mm. Yeah. And what can you invest in using Fund Later? So Fund Later, you can invest in our four major diversified funds, which is where I come into it. So the strategy of that is, you know, we have a conservative fund, which is very heavily weighted to defensive assets, balanced growth and high growth. They're made up between five and seven ETFs. They are international shares, Australian shares, fixed income and cash and property. And it, again, it's all about keeping it as simple as possible. The way we get to that, so let's use balance as the example here. There are 3,353 classified balance funds in Australia. Wow. Really? Yes. Huh. And there's 2,748 growth funds under the same banner. That was checked. So if you do want Is that count, counting all the super funds? Uh, that's the ones you can invest in. That's a good point. That's the ones you can actually physically go and invest in retail or whatever it might be outside of super. Uh, that was done in 2021, so it may have got bigger or smaller depending on which one. But That's to put it into it, yeah. But the reason I use that is that we take all those 3,353 balance funds as a consensus. So how are they as a group of funds, which we think is a lot, consensus invested? How much percentage have they got in fixed income? international domestic how much investment in the inter domestic market have they got as a percentage international property cash mm -hmm. others um, and with others they're always difficult because that's unfortunately it's the only part that we always sit there and giggle about because other can be anything yeah yeah um, it's in a balanced fund it's really really small it's normally about two percent but just be aware you may see this other column and that could be gold. For all you know, it could be crypto. It could be, you know, some form of VC fund. It could mm. be alternatives. It could be investing in, you know, model vintage cars for all you know. Um, so other, we ignore. Yeah. And we put that back into that 2% across the others to, to even it up. So that's how we get there. So those four funds are what we allow you to invest in fund later. Once you basically have done that six grand back, we've got others. We've got single assets that are just international or just fixed income or property and infrastructure if you want to do that hybrids uh, we also actually sorry i forgot we've now got a new one that's only come out in october there is an esg one yeah i did notice that yeah i actually went through the sign up process this morning yeah yeah so I there is now an esg yeah. one um and that's going quite well it's interesting about esg and you and i were talking about this <laughs> offline beforehand the reason esg is interesting is that there's this genuine belief that esg is just environmental mm. and that's not the case environmental, social, and governance. And remember that that weighting in that ESG, not just with us, but across the board, is pretty even. So it's why it explains somebody like a Fortescue, for example, is ESG compliant. So although they don't necessarily pass, or they do just on environment, their social and their governance is A and A+. plus. It's really, really, really strong there. Relationship with the indigenous community mm. over in the West is incredibly strong. The, you know, the building of, of communities over there with you know housing and education is why they do so well. They have very strong representation of females on their board. They have a CEO who's a female. So the you know the governance side is also way. So they pass for that reason, but we get that question. Why are you investing in, in mm -hmm. FMG? That definitely can't be. I'm like, okay, yeah. But they do, you know, when they finish with the land, they do 
repossess and then reconstitute that back into being as environmentally as good as they possibly can. Um, mm. So, yeah, they get a C plus for their environmental standpoint, but if you take them together, they're a B and therefore they pass. Mm. Interesting. So don't forget that if you're listening to ESG and it's obviously off topic, but yeah. you can do that with fund later, our ethical fund. But be aware, it's ethical. It's not environmental. Yeah, it's yeah. the other E. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I think it, I, so. For what it's worth, like, f- and full disclosure, anyone that's listens to this, you'll probably hear an investment ad. They're a long-term sponsor of ours, um, Evan. For what it's worth, I think it's actually a really neatly packaged like investment product and, and way mm-hmm. to start investing because yeah. you mentioned before about that habit of saving. You know, I think one of the good things about having a mortgage. If we can think about it being good, Great is point. is you you're forced to save. So for a lot of people that just are not interested in investing, at least they're paying off an asset, yep. being their home. So it's, it's taking that and putting it into just a diversified scenario. portfolio. Yeah, and yeah. that's exactly the point, right? And this, I think, I want to pick that up because I think this is exactly what should be discussed about your home loan. Mm. Is that it's principal and interest. Getting back to what we talked about before about you know the compound interest problem. If you can get your interest down. But don't change your repayments. You're paying more principal, which means all you're converting is your cash asset into a house asset mm. faster. Yeah. And your cash asset and your house asset, which one's going to grow faster? Yeah. Your house. Yeah. Yeah, let's, let's be honest. So you're right. Again, this is the way I, and why I keep using the word reorientate your view. Understand that it's the same thing. You're ha- paying off your home loan is a habit. It's a great habit. And if you can pay it off faster, that's an even better habit. So it's the same with investing. If you can think of it as paying into an asset that's actually improving your financial you know, scenario, then that's the way to look at it. And that means that, yeah, the advantage of fund later is that it's developing that habit in a positive fashion. It's giving you an asset that will grow and history shows you that it will grow and it will do better than the cash that you currently hold. Mm. Uh, and it, it's all part of that idea. So we're trying to take the, the best parts of buy now, pay later on its head, mm. right? Buy now, pay later is a negative debt. Mm. Definitely. Fun later is a positive debt like your home. Your home is a positive asset because it's a growth asset. Your car is not. It's the same principle. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's the thing with lower balances. You're making it part of your budget that putting money for future you should be a normal thing rather than yes. you're just focusing on the short-term budget needs and then, oh, investing if there's something left over. Yeah, and that's exactly what we're talking about with today, tomorrow, and beyond. Mm. Because a budget is great, but a budget is today. Mm. Um, I like that. Do you make that one up? Yeah. <laughs> yes, it is. Sounds good. And I wasn't going to do it, but I think I will. I'll plug – this is this yeah. is the stuff that I'm writing about in a book that I'm currently doing. It's about mind over money and it's something we'll talk about in the future. But it's exactly that point. A budget is great, but a budget's for today. And by that, what I mean is a budget will be probably 12 months or less. Mm. Like, how am I going to get through the next week? How am I going to get through the next month? Those that are in that scenario, do not feel bad. You will get through it. And a budget will certainly help. But your budget needs to be broader from the point of view that your budget should be okay, I've got my essentials, I need to live, so I need food, I need shelter, rent or home loan, I need energy, so if, you know the fuel for your car or the energy required to, to power your house, I need health, so your health care is always going to be up there and you need education. They're the five mm. that are always seen as essential. That obviously will be in your budget, but then there's other things underneath it and that's something I discuss quite a lot is that that's where the next habit comes in. That's where, okay... I've got those controlled and it's hopefully down to 60% or 70% of your budget. That 30%, that's the good money. That's the money you can actually start using for not just today, but for tomorrow and for beyond. Mm. Mm. I really, so I, 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 I know that Invest Matter are a sponsor of ours. So yes. I, I, I'm fully aware of that. But, um, and we don't receive anything like variable commissions or affiliates or whatever like that. But I do want to double click on this because I actually think I did some of the numbers. Um, if you had $4,000, 
and then you got the six thousand dollar fund later. Mm-hmm. So you get that forced savings habit. But then I now I'm not an accountant, so speak to your accountant. But the, the <laughs> fee can actually also be tax deductible. Yes, it can, and I'm not an accountant either. So yes, put that out. Yeah. But yes, you can say the twenty five bucks. Yeah, it can be tax deductible. Is tax deductible, and it's forcing you to save. Typically, if you do the six thousand dollars over twenty months, it would be three hundred bucks, like you said. Three hundred bucks. Yeah, and then you can do it again if you if you want to afterwards, right? Like you could. You can yeah. technically start again and yeah. go. I want another. Here's my next four grand and. Let's yeah. do another 6K over the top. Yeah. Um, you can certainly do that. Again, if that's the way that helps you, by all means. Mm. Or you uh, could just, like you said, continue on your merry way. Or just way. leave a direct debit on. Correct. Yeah. That's what we would hope. Yeah. So yeah. what Kate just pointed out, again, that's on your app. You just let that go. If you've been you know, absorbing 300 bucks a month for 20 months. You'll just keep it up. Then why would you stop? Yeah. Because it, all of a sudden it's developed that habit. And not only that, you're clearly not thinking about it. And, and that's, I think, the other part of this is that your thought process is part of this. If you're not worried about 300 bucks coming out of your month, out of your, your budget, let's use the term that you used before, Kate, you can therefore continue to absorb it. You don't need to stop the day mm. the 20 months finishes. Because again, as we refer to it in economics, there's economies of scale. The large, and again, the, the Warren Buffett trade here is the idea, is that the larger the pool of funds that you have, the bigger your returns will be. The more dividends you're going to get, the larger exposure you have with a better cost base because it will keep getting better for you. Mm. All of that habit from just saving 300 bucks a month, continuing past 20 months, means you're exposed to all of that in a positive fashion. Mm. And so that's like, you know, if as Owen said, yeah, by all means, start again and, and we will ha- certainly help you do that. But again, there is also the option that if you're in it, you're away. I mean, yeah. again, what we normally see with people that are doing it, they're actually bringing their friends in or they're bringing their kids in. Like, mm. okay, I've done fun later to 10 grand for myself, I now need to get my kids started. So here's four grand for my child and the six grand. And yeah, let's right. Go. Yeah, okay. That makes a lot of sense. And that would be a great way to get a, a family member involved because yeah. I think also there's like a psychological thing here where you see a $10,000 balance as opposed to a f- like $4,000 balance. Yes, you do. And aside from the money and the dividends and all that, it actually, it's like, oh, I've got 10K here. If I only pay this off over the next little while, um, I think that's pretty, pretty powerful too. So I like it. Yeah, so and we're... We're really lucky to, and we're, we're quite proud of it because, as I said to you, we think we have spun the whole idea on its head mm. and, and actually turning spending behavior into investing behavior. And I think that's the most important take out of the whole thing is that it's actually like a home loan going towards an asset that's actually a good asset mm. rather than an asset that unfortunately can go to zero. You yeah. close, unfortunately, as nice as they look, and some people can sell them on eBay for something, they're never going to be an asset that's appreciating. Mm. Um, and that's why the evaluation is always the house and the car, right? Yeah. yeah. A car's nice and you might feel great in it, but it's still an asset that's going to go to zero. Yeah. Um, your house is not going to go to zero. Mm. The clothing or spending you did on buy now, pay later is going to go to zero. The spending investment you do in fun later isn't going to go to zero. Mm. Mm. And I think as much as like, if you're starting with a low balance, automation is so important, whether it's yeah. fund later or it's micro investing, super managed funds, mm-hmm. whatever you're using, automating as much as possible. I mean, that's how I started in when I started setting up automations in 2016 and 2017. Some of them are still going today and they're just happening in the background. I don't yeah. even have to think about it. So it's just those small amounts every month. They're really all controlled up. on this. It's all yeah. on your phone. Yeah. So again, like everybody else, we've got the app. And that's it's so much easier too from the point of view that if you want to keep that automation going, and you do, uh, some people love to watch it every day and that's fair enough. At least it's there in the palm of your hand mm. um, because the average person these days because of apps are now checking their bank balance significantly more than they were beforehand, mm. which is a positive thing. So at least people have a much bigger, better understanding of their balance of where their cash is. It's the same thing with fun later. At least you can sit there and watch it, understand how it's growing, where your current payoffs are going, where your whole portfolio is going. And actually, as you said, your word orange perfect i've got 10 grand not four mm. Um, mm. Yeah. or even better i've got 10 grand not 100 yeah so micro investing by all means look at it but just remember the fees are the killer and that's why starting at 10 grand gives you and goes away from the cost factor so you go from 14 and a half you know near enough to 15 percent on your brokerage to f- for for what we do with fund later it's 495 right that's point you know, 0.05 of 1% sort mm. of stuff. 
Mm. much, much more conducive and therefore fees aren't eating into what you're trying to do. Mm. Yeah. And Evan, I know you're a fan of behavioral psychology and I'm quite interested for your thoughts Love it. from going from <laughs> being a, a new investor, which many of our community have started investing over the last three years, but kind of graduating to an intermediate investor. I don't know if that conversation has been had that much, but how do you like, even make that behavioral shift? Wow. Great question. Mm. Unfortunately, my answer will be experience and, and I, it, nothing will help you go from being a beginner to an intermediary without actually being involved. Mm. Like, you know, experience over education, unfortunately, is probably true. Um, because again, getting back to what I do in strategy and getting to what I do, until you experience a now with a downturn, and we're obviously sitting here on the 25th of May in 2022, where we are going through some volatile periods, all of that understanding doesn't come to fruition until you actually feel it. And I know you've done it. I remember you and I working together when we had some <laughs> volatile periods and you were two and a half, three years into your time. So you had had some experience, which was great. I will also say this. When I started, I was 20 and I don't mind saying how old I'm now. I'm 37. Um, and it's taken me a long time to get to not only just be confident with it, but also not to nuance it. Um, and I think that's the other word here is that when you get to intermediary, you start believing you're probably a little bit better than maybe you are. Mm. I think that also needs to be open and being really, really disciplined with yourself that you will make mistakes and that is fine. It's about minimizing the mistakes and again, staying inside that strategy because if you start you know, cherry picking or stock picking or doing outside of what you're designed to do, you'll make mistakes. So going from a beginner to intermediate tree, in my view, is that. Yeah. It's learning that because I've done it. I mean, I'll put my hand up. One of the biggest mistakes I ever made was a company called Bought Longyear. For those oh, yeah. who, yeah, yeah back in the day, particularly in the tens, they were seen as the absolute bee's knees, up and coming sort of materials handling slash engineering provider to the energy space, particularly in oil and gas. And they flunked it constantly. Um, and everything they told you, and, and, and again, that was my learning. That's when I moved away from being a bottom-up analyst into actually going, nah, I need to come from the other direction mm. because you can do all the work and the, everything the company was telling you on paper looks fantastic, growth profile, blah, blah, blah. But actually, in reality, they were really poor mm. um, and bought long year was my burnt fingers moment that took me from <laughs> being a beginner to an intermediate tree. To what I now actually believe I am is more than intermediary is actually somebody that does this for a living and actually does quite well out of it. And I'm not blowing my own trumpet. It's more that the reason I do well is that I don't get involved with that. Mm, right. So, battles. Yeah. And again, that's the Warren Buffett principle. Um, people go at me constantly because I'm really quite negative on crypto because it's well and truly out of most people's strategy. And it should be. By all means, I'm so happy for those of you that have made money out of crypto. Hats off. Congrats. But I doubt that it was originally part of your, your process. I really do. Um, and that, I think, is your question. Beginner, intermediary, an actual structured understanding investment person mm. is those shiny things look great. They will burn you mm. and give you some pretty burnt fingers. And I know Owen and I know you, Kate, have had those experiences. Mm. Yeah, no, I think that's yeah. like the trick. Once you get to that intermediate level, you start having that um, idea that you should start fiddling and making your strategy a bit yeah. more complex and level up where you don't actually have to do something dramatically Le Level different. up is just scaling. Yeah. I think that's a great term. Level up is a great term, but that's just scaling. That's yeah. right. I've got my low-cost ETFs or I've got my healthcare sector or I've got my BHP, my CBA, blah, blah, blah. It's just scaling that up rather than getting tricky. You don't need a mm. complex strategy. I yeah. don't know. We feel like the wealthy people have these really complex yeah. strategies. So therefore, if we've been investing for five years, we should be doing yeah. something. Yeah, we do should. they? I mean, yeah. again, if you look at the real big hitters, the big hitters out there, they have really simple stuff, mm. Mm. right? Okay, yeah, you can celebrate a hedge fund manager or some alpha fund or some macro fund. Great. But they're the exception to the rule. And again, getting to back to what InvestMart does and a lot of those kind of providers that are out there, they'll show that over 10 years, those guys will end up coming back to the market anyway. So yeah, they may have given you 50% last year, but they're struggling this year. And again, not, not picking on anybody, but there's a very, very famous Australian fund out of Sydney that starts with an M that was that, that is now in real trouble 
with the amount of people that are withdrawing funds, finding out that they're actually returning not just at the market but below market. Mm. Don't break your strategy. Yeah. Short yeah, answer. Okay. Yeah. After that massive ramble. Yeah. I like <laughs> so, Evan, I've got one last question um, and this is just like a cherry picking one, which is what's one – actionable strategy or insight or just idea that you want to leave with our listeners today like what's one thing they can do today whether they're getting started or whether they're just trying to as we said before level up simplicity it's one word mm -hmm. i think that's the way just to, simplicity it, i understand that when you let's use the starting example for mm -hmm. my takeaway when you're starting it is scary it is big it's wide so simplicity is absolutely key then look up the easiest and simplest way. So it's even just typing into Google, simple investment strategy mm. or simple investment ideas. And they will pop up. They will pop up in front of you. So that includes somebody like InvestSmart who I work for. I don't want to plug for them, but it, it's more about once you have that simplicity, it should then be a fairly simple, straightforward process. Stop trying to think that you need to be, as Kate's last question was, be an intermediary or a, you know an expert stock picker. It's not that because as soon as you do that, you won't start and you'll do what my mum did for 20 years and not start. Simplicity is the absolute key because once you've started, once you've got a core set up that is simple, easy and replicable, like you can actually replicate it over and over and over and over again, everything will flow from there. And that I think is the start point. Anything you do, whether it's investing, your home loan, whatever it is, the simpler it is, the better it's going to be for you. Mm. And keeping things simple means you can actually understand what's going on and yeah. you can actually take that first step, get started and build yep. your own financial confidence. And hands up, I, I, my, my portfolio now is simple, mm. right? When I started, it was complex and I was watching it every day and I was doing X, Y, Z. I don't do it anymore because I've got a job and I've got things to do that means that I can't watch my portfolio you know, between 10 and 4 at Saturday Eastern Standard Time when the market's open. I just can't do that anymore. I don't have the time. Mm. So simplicity is the answer not just for a beginner but for all hmm. because compound interest <laughs> full stop full circle yeah full circle yeah evan um i'm sure we'll have you on the show again but uh we'll eagerly await this book that you're working on yes um we really appreciated your time today coming to talk to us in person about fun later and just what you do as well i think it's fascinating and guys, thank you so much yeah. for having me. It's been really good. It's nice to see real people and actually have a proper discussion. <laughs> we um, don't get many people in person in our office, it so it's nice. exciting. It is very yeah. nice to be in, in, in an office and actually talk. So thank you so much for having me. Thanks yeah. for joining us. And if people want to find out a bit more about you or catch you on TV, where should they go? So if you want to find out a bit more about me, you can find me on socials. I am on Twitter, so Evan Lucas underscore INV or LinkedIn. On screen and stuff like that that you're alluding to, look, I am very lucky that I get to go on the ABC, on Sky, I get to go on Channel 9 and all those things. So ABC on a Wednesday um, and then I do a lot of radio as well. So I'm really lucky again to be on radio with either you know, 3AW, 2GB um, and ABC Radio as well. So I'm very, very lucky. So I, I unfortunately, my voice is in your ear a bit too often. <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll, put, we'll put all the links yeah. in the show notes and we'll, yeah, we'll... Um We'll follow you up on Twitter as well. Please uh, do. Yeah. Um, and of course, if you want to learn more about Fun Later, you can find out more about that in the show notes. There's a link there. So uh, go and check that out. Evan, once again, thanks for joining us. Cheers, guys.